Hey guys, it may have been a little while, but welcome back to the channel. We're always happy to have you here at the Linux Tube. We actually love being able to make content for you. Today is going to be a little, 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 little bit different. I'm going to be talking about and doing more of a talking head video with you because there's something that definitely needs to be talked about, something I realized recently in a podcast. So before we get into that, if you would go ahead and comment, like, and subscribe, that would be always great. It always, always helps us get our content out to more people. And if you wouldn't mind sharing, if you're capable of on Mastodon or whatever socials you use, that would be appreciated as well. So today we're going to be talking a little about something a little bit more unique and a little bit more different to the Linux space. So a lot of us that are more involved with Linux and that have been using it for a lot longer, we tend to forget that many of the new users don't know a lot of the things we do, or we assume that they're coming from a tech background. And really, that's not really okay. And a lot of that is because where well, we are ignorant to what they know now. And we have to start in that department. Because, well, each of these individuals, they come in because either Microsoft has hurt them, Apple has hurt them in some way, or their hardware is just getting older, so they don't get support anymore, such as with like Windows 11. So let's go ahead and talk about what we should do if we have a Linux user join our community. So what we I would always do before and what we need to start doing going forward, I'll start with the first topic there. What I would typically always do before is just ask them what they're doing. And then if they have a question, they'll usually jump in and ask. But then if I'm wanting to solve their problem, I usually just say what they need to do. I don't go into the million different details for the fact of they probably don't know what a lot of it means. And I'll just explain in a very generic way of what it does and not the itsy bitsiness of each individual thing. So, but what we need to be doing better is that, or at least I will for sure for me, but I really hope people take into heart is that these each individual people, whenever they jump in, we need to show them the experience of what it's going to be like before they even get into the ecosystem. Right, because when they jump in, they have actually like their feet are planted on the ground in this ecosystem now. We need to try to incorporate them and involve them in another way before they even jump in, like and actually do an installation. Because first, the thing they can do is they can jump in by using something like WSL or VMware or uh, VirtualBox if you really want to use that or KMU if they already know how to use that and to have them use those to install Linux in a virtual environment and let them play with that for, I would say a couple of weeks before they even try to jump into the actual installation of Linux. And the primary reason for this is because they need to get used to the utilities and how there are not, a lot of the utilities that don't have an equivalent or the equivalent's not up to par with the Windows variant, such as with video editing, right? We have, Things like Caden Live, but if you compare Caden Live to Adobe, Adobe products, it's just nowhere close to the same quality of product. Where, whereas we have DaVinci Resolve, yes, we have a Windows and a Linux version. Something to note is on the Linux version, it's missing a lot of the codecs that the Windows version has. Or if you're jumping from Mac OS to Linux, they have their, their own Apple product for video editing and that has a similar interface which you can do in DaVinci Resolve but the same issues as what Windows does missing a lot of the codecs and the other thing to note is if they want to be able to jump in and use something like this they're probably gonna have to pay for DaVinci Resolve if they want the nicer product and that's really the only good solid per version or piece of software for this instance you know that's just one out of a million different instances that something like this happens with I mean, you can think of others, right? We have word processing applications such as LibreOffice, OnlyOffice, and FreeOffice, so many more, but there's only a couple of them that even get close to matching the, the, the premium piece of software on Windows in this scenario. And that would be Microsoft Office, of course. I, whenever I recommend, I usually will say things like OnlyOffice because it's the closest thing and it's almost a one-to-one -one copy. But again, it's not Microsoft Office, so they may not be comfortable with it. You know, you see what I'm saying here? You get it? Yeah, because an alternative is not the same thing as what they were using before, and I can understand where they're coming from. 
So by helping them adapt and learn how to use these pieces of software by being their friend and explaining things and not just shoving them into the deep end, we're allowing for them to have a smoother transition. The big thing I always try to explain to somebody is after I've shown them the little bit differences in software is the big differences, which would be like GIMP versus Photoshop, for instance. GIMP is very different. But what I will do is I will go use from like a GitHub project such as Photo GIMP and take that and show them the slight differences between Photoshop and that and then allow for them to learn it that way. But after six months to a year of them doing that, they've already been in the Linux ecosystem for long enough and it allows for them to go ahead and continue to do what they're doing, right? But then eventually they'll realize, oh, this is a little bit different. Something just clicks in the brain and they'll eventually maybe start trying to use it more in the traditional sense because there's actually some advantages of doing it that way. So whenever they do this, we have to then go ahead and show them the bigger picture of Linux. We should not be rushing it like a lot of us have been doing. You know, a lot of these people are just jumping in and starting to learn Arch Linux as our first distribution. And that's just because of these third party distributions such as, as in the past, I'm highlighting them, not pointing against them. There's in the past we had Zero Linux, we had Endeavor OS, we had Arco Linux, which is a little bit more in depth and more involved. But we have all of these third party distributions that made it easier to install. But by doing this, it makes it where they do get in the ecosystem. It allows for them to be new to Linux, but it also makes it where they don't have to necessarily learn all of the utilities they need because they can rely on other people to tell them how to do it. And that's why I typically just tell people not to use Arch Linux as our first distribution because it's so involved and so hard to use for your newbie. It's not no hard for us maybe as later on in the in our experiences, right? We don't we didn't typically jump in as Arch as our first distro. At least I didn't. I actually used Ubuntu as the first thing and I did. I did 8.04. So if you if we're gonna do it, we need to start recommending different distributions that are a little bit easier to use. Like in my brain, I typically recommend Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, those type of things. I don't even recommend OpenSUSE to most people anymore because there are some quirks with it which people have to understand and know how to use. So I wouldn't necessarily say that's a beginner friendly distribution. But with something like Fedora, it's backed by a large corporation just like OpenSUSE is, but it has been finally tested and it's even set up to where it's an extremely stable experience at the end. Like if we look at Debian, they do a similar type of thing. They have Debian Unstable, which is Debian SID, Debian testing, and then they have their stable release. I typically tell people to use the stable release, and once they get used to that and get understanding of how it works, then I say, okay, by the way, this does exist, such as like testing or SID, and I will explain how they can upgrade to it, what they need to watch out for, and then what they can continue to do to try to make their experience stable and work for them. So the big thing I always have to point out, though, whenever I'm having people convert to Linux, is that we have to be nice, right? We have to also explain to them that we need in a way that they can understand what we're trying to do. The The way I was always told growing up, if I'm explaining it to someone, it's like if I was learning it myself, that's the way I'm going to explain it to them. But if that doesn't work for me, what I usually do is do a secondary way of doing it, and that is, for lack of better words, explain it like a five-year-old, so a five-year-old would understand it. I'm not saying anybody's dumb here. Nobody is. It's just a very easy and very hard to misunderstand way to do something or explain something. So that's the easiest way that I do it at least. So whenever I look at Linux, right, I typically will say something like, hey, have you heard of Linux? Or, hey, look what I'm doing. And I will show them everything I can do on my machine, showing them that it does work. And then over the next five, six months, I'll continue to show them because of the fact of it shows it's still up and it's still running, right? If I can prove to them it's going to work, work long term, they might be more willing to try it. If I show them that it works on most hardware and they're not going to have to pay for updates, they might even more want it more then. Whenever I start getting to more of the year, year and a half down the road, I will start explaining, hey, this is going to work 10 years from now. Is your machine going to work? They'll start asking those type of things. But the big thing is, if somebody doesn't want to use Linux, don't make them. You don't. They don't have to use it. That's their decision. But if you want to encourage the use of it, 
generally it's just a good idea just to give them little snippets over a period of time and maybe one day they might want to and that's when you help them. But going back to the general topic, I know I have to Im improve in a lot of ways on what I teach for Linux, for sure. I'm not the best at it and neither are probably anybody who's watching this. And that's just because we all have to improve. So by my, my biggest thing I'm changing for sure is the way I'm approaching new people. Because I forget that some people don't know some of the things I know, right? Like I've had somebody recently asking about how something in Fedora worked. So what I did, instead of me just assuming I knew it, I gave him off, I pushed him off to somebody else who did know, who knew better than I did, right? Don't just assume that we can explain, explain everything. So the biggest thing I have to give, I have to explain to somebody, and there's different ways of doing this, is explaining to somebody they need to read a wiki of some sort. Because there's only so much time in the day each of us has to explain to this person, right? So instead of us just trying to vom word vomit everything at them, we should just say, okay, here is the resource. Don't even send them to a website. Take like a screenshot or just copy and paste what they need and send that to them. That gives a different vibe and a different under understanding from a user that's coming new to Linux than just saying, go here and read this. It also gives a different connotation, a different tone whenever you're speaking to them as well. So keep that in mind as well. I know whenever I'm teaching somebody to learn Linux or including them in the process of learning Linux, we also have to understand the way we're saying things because one way of saying things versus another can be very different. For instance, let's say we're talking to a parent about our dog. We, if we yell it at them, they're not going to listen. If we talk calmly at them or with them, then they're going to listen to what we have to say because we're, it's just the way they feel and they understand, okay, this person is not being hostile. So whenever we have this communication, we also have to do this with people joining our community as well. Because if we're just yelling at them or we're making them feel unwelcome, they're not going to stay. I've seen this in the past, 10 plus years ago, this was in the Arch Linux community. It's not so bad now, but there are definitely still people out there that do that. I can for sure understand how it may be frustrating after seeing hundreds, thousands, if not tens of thousands of the same message, but at the same time, at that point, just set up a, a page on GitHub or something to refer them to and they say, and explain whenever you're sending them there, say, hey, this is exactly how I did it. If you want to try this, if it doesn't work, come back and ask me more questions. Because then that pushes them off for now, but then allows for them to come back if they have any questions. If a person is not going to read, though, that's when, unfortunately, it may just be time to say, hey, are you sure you want to do this? But if they don't want to do this, they don't have to. Again, it's their choice. But if they want to do this, that's when it's time to have the discussion of saying, hey, this is a lot more work than you think it might be. And that's okay. By, by giving up some of the easy to useness, the punctuality per se, you're allowing for yourself the freedoms of not being controlled by a big company. It allows for you to control your own hardware and allow you to do whatever you want with it rather than, rather than being constrained by the restriction the large company gives you. So by generally doing something like that and explaining the standards and setting those boundaries, it allows for the person to understand where you're coming from and why this is a transition, right? A transitions are not easy. They never have been. And being, having that going straight like up front is very important, at least to me. Because if I'm just going to say, oh, it's a piece of cake, no, no, then I'm lying to this individual. I'm not telling them the truth, which is not okay, in my personal opinion. I think it's important to make sure people understand what they're getting into. Whenever I recommend a distribution, like I mentioned earlier, though, we have to think about the major distros. I didn't mention it before, but I would also recommend things like Linux Mint, right? It's Ubuntu-based. But it's also definitely pushed at the new user for sure, because Cinnamon is framed and organized a lot like Windows is in terms of design. And then there's a lot of GUI utilities to make things very easy to do. For instance, their driver utility, it just automatically detects your hardware and installs for you. I would say a little bit something a little bit more controversial because the idea behind it is troubling, 
But what their modern version of is, is actually pretty good, even though I actually made a recent video about it. It was my last one. Manjaro actually isn't so bad anymore. In the past, they've had issues with SSL certificates and other things, but they've actually done a very, very, very good job at keeping up with it. And they have so many different variants of it. But what I would do is I would give them the KDE version of Manjaro and then let them be, learn on their own as well. But always be there as a resource for them if they have questions. Too many people will just give somebody a distribution and expect them to learn at 100% by themselves. That's not fair and that's not okay in my book because you're not giving them the opportunity to have a database to go to if they're needing help, right? Microsoft has all of this. They have, I mean, a lot of this. They have a massive website for almost everything with Microsoft Windows. They have a large user base, which can also help them. By the, with Linux, where are you gonna go for each of these things, right? You're gonna have to rely on the people. And if the people aren't willing to be that large source of information, then where are they gonna go? They're just gonna get flustered and leave. That's not something we want to do with these people. We want to allow them the opportunity to really give this operating system a chance. So if we go ahead and continue down this road and they finally got used to their distribution, that's when they'll probably start asking what else is out there. That's when I would just continue to give them the easy to use distros because it allows for them to use those, right? And then maybe whenever you get a hint in an under, underlying understanding that this person understand how it fundamentally works, that's when we go on to the next level, which I consider like arch and void, etc. And then they can start playing and start learning how to compile things on their own, on installing how to use an AUR helper or something along those lines, allowing for them to get other software that just in untraditional ways. So honestly, it's, it's amazing that we as a community have seemed to almost have failed in this regard and we have not been as understanding to new newbies as we probably should be. So I hope this really helps. And I think it's very important that each of us takes this time and consideration that new people are really, really willing to come and join our community and see how we are. That's why we at the Linux Tube try as hard as we do to accept newbies and understand what we do. That's why we have a lounge for when people need help. That's why I let people go ahead and tag me whenever they need help. Because I get it. I was there at one point in time. I may, if you, if I have questions, I do my best to help. But again, like I said, there's always ways I can improve. There's always ways you can, can improve. And I really hope this continues to get better. So with each of us as individuals, we have to remember also that when people, somebody jumps to Linux, they have the understanding of how Windows work, or they have the understanding of how Mac OS works. Those are fundament, fundamentally different in so many ways. It just can't be compared. So that's why I was mentioning how it's important to explain to them that it fundamentally works differently. If that's scary, that's when you take the time to explain why it's not so scary. That's really what's important. Typically, I will highlight things like it allows more hardware support. It allows for you to keep your computer longer, like I mentioned earlier. It all, I would also say it also means you can clock your CPU at whatever you want doesn't mean you have to stick with what they said. I do those type of things. So the other, but like with the way they fundamentally work differently, it's very important to really understand where they're coming from as well. You know, if you haven't looked at Windows or Mac OS in 10 plus years, spin up a VM or use it on hardware for a little bit. It's very important to go ahead and revisit the other operating systems that we don't use as our daily driver, just so that we can understand their perspective. Because if we can't understand their perspective, how do we expect them to understand our perspective? So generally speaking, if you're gonna go ahead and try to move somebody over to Linux, just be as understanding as you can, be there as a resource, and then show them how to gain all the knowledge they need to be successful. Because those are the three things we don't generally do as well as we probably should. So if you guys wouldn't mind, if you go ahead and comment, like, and subscribe on this video, be absolutely outstanding and if you would go ahead and uh, let me know how this audio is, it probably is quite a bit better. I got a new mic. I, uh, I look forward to it.